Candice, thank you so much for speaking with me. Um, right away, this was so educational and also entertaining as well, which is what I really loved about you, basically about education. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to know was, it discussed the important roles that hammer sharks play, but I was wondering, there's so much that don't know about them and still can you talk about the importance of that conservation even though we don't know so much about them what is it that we need more to learn yeah i mean so the the great hammerhead shark which is the focus um, of our show is critically endangered so there's a a group called the iucn the international union for conservation of nature that kind of classifies animals uh based on their level of threat of, of extinction and critically endangered is one step away from extinct in the wild. So uh, obviously that's something that we would like to avoid. And so even, you know, just without talking about anything like ecological roles or anything like that, you never want an animal to go extinct. And so um, that alone is, is a reason to study them and to push for conservation. Um, additionally, because they're so elusive, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to study them. So that's why there are a lot of gaps um, in our knowledge. And so we want to really work to do different things. There's a lot of work being done, um, especially on their movement patterns. That's the focus of another uh, girl in my lab's PhD, um, which was some of the tags we were hoping to put out um, to find out information about their moving, their movement, and get some really cool 3D models of, of their movements um, to try to understand when they're hunting, um, you know, how fast are they going, understand their energy use. Um, there's so much, like I said, the list goes on and on um, to learn about them. But the, uh, you know, the, the real, uh, I guess, driving factor is the fact that any animal that is listed as critically endangered, you really want to work to understand as much as you can, such that you can help get that animal delisted. Right. One of the things I was really interested in, 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 the documentary, in the documentary, it explained that they traveled between Florida and Bahamas. It talked about what kind of foods, that, the fish that they ate. My question is, due to climate change, have you seen any of changes between how they travel, also different kind of fish that they may now eat because of either limited resources? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, they do travel between the Bahamas and Florida. And one interesting point about that is when they cross the jurisdictional boundaries into the US, they are now uh, not protected from fishing. So in the Bahamas, it's a shark sanctuary, which means that um, shark fishing, shark trade of shark and shark parks is prohibited. So when they're in the jurisdictional waters of the Bahamas, they're, they're relatively safe as far as, as far as you can go for uh, having fishing regulations. Um, but, when they get to Florida, that's not the case. So that's already a, a kind of challenge uh, conservation wise is the fact that these highly migratory animals, they don't know the difference between an arbitrary jurisdictional boundary, right? So they don't know where safety stops and starts. Um, but in terms of the climate change, sharks do have thermal preferences. And so they are impacted by uh, the ocean uh, warming. So, for example, in, in Bimini in the Bahamas, where we were, and which is one of the, the main places where you see these hammerhead sharks, um, you start to see, they're starting to see them show up later and later um, because the water is not cooling down as, as soon as it was in the past. Um, so that is a, a big, uh, something that's easily noticeable in the fact that the sharks are not there as soon as you would expect them to be because the water is just still too hot for them. Wow. Now, also in the documentary, it showed that there was a kind of a larger population around the bridge in Florida. And so is there a reason for that? Yeah. So in around that bridge, they there's something it's called the sorry, my dog is in the back having a moment. Um, something called the tarpon run. So uh, a prey species for this animal, like tons of tarpon come through at certain times of year around those bridges. And so the hammerheads kind of capitalize on that. Okay. Now, you guys came around like 18 inches shy of finding the world's largest hammerhead, but there's still, you know, still searching every day. Has there kind of been an update on that? Um, we have not. Um, there's still yet to measure anything larger than the, the known record, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, and, you know, it's the, the large animals. It's really good to learn about them because it's you can assume that larger animals play a different ecological role than smaller animals. And so we still, um, obviously any animal you catch 
provides valuable data no matter the size. Um, but there is still, you know, the record has not been broken. Now, there was a large population of, of, of larger sharks just in general. So that is a positive sign of something. I was wondering, what does that mean kind of toward the ecosystem by enabled by, sorry, by finding the much larger sharks as compared to the smaller ones like the tiger? Yeah, I mean, so different sharks kind of play different roles depending on, you know, on size kind of comes into that in the fa sense of if you think about, you know, the top predator, you know, not not every single shark is the top predator because some sharks eat eat smaller sharks, um, you know, something like, I don't know, like a black tip shark is not at necessarily at the top of the food chain. And so it's important to keep that in mind as well, because people automatically think sharks top predator, and that's not necessarily the case. And then when it comes to the, the larger of the species, they're obviously kind of more, even more of the top predator because there sometimes is like a hierarchical uh, system in, in sharks. They, you know, smaller sharks will avoid larger sharks or get out of the way of larger sharks, you know, because at the end of the day, they have to protect themselves as well. And something larger than you, you would, you would kind of look at as a predator. Um, larger sharks also would have uh, most likely a better or longer migration patterns so then they're tra transferring nutrients further um they're able to get more prey which can help kind of uh reduce you know sick or or um kind of uh you know the sharks do a good job of basically picking off sick animals so that helps those populations as well um and they keep populations in check right if sharks if sharks stopped existing then there might be a boom in the stingray population which might result in you know, a crash of their prey and then a crash of, you know, it's important that every level is maintained. So you, you maintain that balance in the ecosystem. You seen any kind of decrease or increase because of the hammerhead sharks, either more growing or because of their um, decreased population? Um, not too much. I mean, I think there's just still so much to know that it's hard to say. Um, but, you know, the conservation efforts are there. And so I think that uh, as things start to improve and more people buy in, um, there will be, you know, it's hopeful that this animal can get listed as less than critically endangered. There are a lot of misconceptions that people have about sharks, especially in general, that can either hurt their conservation. So my question to you is, what are some of the misconceptions that right away we can just get away of and help these animals? Yeah, well, I mean, I think people, you know, people are quick to let the media uh, impact their perception of something. So, you know, something like Jaws, you know, people think as soon as you think shark, you think Jaws. And that's obviously not uh, a positive portrayal of sharks. Right. So I think it's the first thing to think is, first of all, we're in their home. Um, they are not in ours. Right. Sharks cannot infest the waters because that's where they live. Um the same way that if somebody was breaking breaking into your house unexpectedly, you might act a little defensively. You can uh, understand why the shark might do the same. Um, additionally, you know, again, the sharks are not out to get us. They are not man eaters. They, we are not on the menu. Um, Any time that a shark interaction occurs is a, is a case of mistaken identity. Um, nine times out of ten, you know, if you're surfing or in a kayak or something that might look like potential prey. Um, sharks obviously don't have hands, so they cannot just feel that, oh, no, that wasn't that seal, that wasn't that turtle. They actually have that tactile response through their bite, and which is why a lot of times you have that bite and release, because they've now realized, okay, that's not what I was going for. Um, but I think the biggest thing to think is just to respect that everything has its place on the planet, um, and we just have to do our best to coexist can we do as the average citizen to help conserve these sharks? Um, there's lots you can do. I mean, you can, you know, things as simple as, as decreasing your plastic use because pollution is a problem um, can, has an has a effect from the bottom up, right? It's not just saving the, the turtles or whatever you think of as things that necessarily eat these, this plastic. Um, that, that's something simple. You can also... Um, I think one thing to do is to to get out there and, and try to see these animals firsthand and form your opinion for yourself and not let simply the 
views that you're seeing on social media or, you know, television or uh, movies give you your perception of sharks. May I ask what got you into conservation, especially in terms of the sharks? Uh, well, I think growing up um, in the Bahamas, I've always been enamored with the ocean and, and the animals that live in it. Um, and I've, I've actually always been drawn to, you know, that, that negative perception of, okay, well, let me figure out why people are so anti-shark. Um, and also just swimming, when you swim with them, um, they're just a, a majestic creature that deserves your respect. And I think that kind of jump-started my desire to, to uh, learn as much as I can about them and kind of be an advocate for shark conservation. We saw the physical, how physical it is, you know, going out there and doing the tasks and collecting the data. Can you talk about that mental preparation that you go through? Yeah, so it takes quite a bit um, to get ready for a field, a field day. Um, it's a lot of heavy lifting. It's a lot of, uh, you know, blood, sweat and tears. You know, it's, it's easy enough to think, oh, we'll go out there and catch some sharks. But that's not how fishing works right? You can only put your gear in the water and hope that what you're looking for takes it. So it does take a lot of mental fortitude um, to keep keep at it, especially if you're not getting what you're hoping for. Um, but in the end, it, it just takes that perseverance and having a good crew and having a good time while doing it really makes it well worthwhile. Research and out in the field, has there ever been either a piece of data that has been the most surprising to you? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think so. I think that every, everything that you have to learn is always new and exciting. Um, it's, I think the biggest treat is generally when you're, you know, targeting A, but you see Z, you know, like if you're out there to look for something, for example, like this whale shark, it, we just came upon it, right? It's when the ocean kind of gives you those gifts. Um, that's when it's really the most exciting. Any, like, say, for example, the whale shark and the hammerhead shark, have you seen any kind of change in their relation because of, say, climate change or how they interact just in general with other uh, sharks, species, varieties? Um, I think sharks are still interacting in pretty much the same ways. Um, it's just more a matter of uh, which sharks are more tolerant to that change. Um, those ones will kind of win out, right, which of what you're seeing. Um uh, how many of them you're seeing versus the other. But in terms of the interactions, they're pretty pretty much the same. Wonderful. Thank you so much for speaking to me. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I love learning about nature and all these different mammals and animals that are on this planet. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me.